Hello, Renz. Welcome to the 100X show. Hey, Mehdi. Happy to be here. Uh, yeah, at, at Token Metrics, we are very excited about ReadyDAO. We covered the project before the IDO, and it scored highly on our uh, hidden gem report. Uh, so very excited to have you. Our community had a few questions. I had a few questions. So just want to explore that with you today. Yeah, thank you so much. And I'd be happy to share whatever it is that you know, you've been wondering for so long, and then maybe like share it with your audience as well. Perfect. So, Renz, uh, just to kick things off, uh, tell our audience a little bit about your background and your team. So, with this question, I'm trying to assess a founder market fit. Gotcha. Yeah. So, I mean, if you look at our resumes, we're mostly ex-consultants, ex-data scientists, ex-you know, uh, individuals who come from like huge corporations, MNCs, FMCGs, uh, and the like, right? So I'm pretty sure like we have the competence uh, at a global scale uh, uh, to deal with like all of these things. And we've done this like a, a lot of times uh, over the course of our journey, right? Um, but I think what's not on the resume is that all of us are avid fans of gaming in general. Um, myself in particular, I, you know, I, I've done, I've played like Counter-Strike, moved to like League of Legends, Dota, uh, and then moved to like even mobile. Um, and then... Uh, a, a bunch of other people from the same from the team as well are really passionate about gaming, so I feel like you know it, we kind of jive the intersection between gaming and expertise in our respective fields, uh, and and that's a cohort or at least that's the kind of people that we have here at Breeder. Yeah, that's a that's a very good over, overview. Um, I believe you guys also have a superstar team when it comes to advisors. Maybe also touch touch upon that. Maybe that also helps. Sure. So, I mean, one that's most prominent, at least within the industry, would be Gabby Eden, right? Uh, Gabby was actually one of the mentors that I had uh, when I first ventured into the space as well. Um, we actually ran the concept by him initially. And you know how it is, right? Uh, he started a guild. We were like, hmm, is there an opportunity on the other side of the equation? And he was like, you know, the single biggest pain point of a lot of like guilds owners and even games is a lack of quality asset in the market. And so immediately when he said that, we were like, okay, I mean, if Gabby says there's like a product market fit here and there's like a gap that we're trying to solve, then, you know, he was actually the first one who created or pioneered this entire guild system and found that niche. So if he says that there's actually a need, then there must be a need, right? So yeah, I mean, Gabby, and then we also have Ryan Wyatt, who heads like YouTube gaming, uh, at least like when, at the time that we, we, we had this conversation and he's now the CEO of Polygon Studios. Um, we also have Pierce Kicks, uh, who's bit with Bitcraft and Delphi Ventures. Uh, and then um, Farsi's team, like Leia and uh, Nathan Smale, who actually worked on the, the first play to earn documentary video that really uh, introduced the entire Axie Infinity to the market. And then most recently, we just got like uh, Jihos, uh, who started <laughs> this blockchain gaming application. I mean, there has been like a lot of games prior to them, right? But uh, I think they were the ones who kind of... Um, really made this one like uh, go mainstream. And uh, even though Axie Infinity has had its hiccups, uh, it still is the largest like uh, blockchain gaming out there. Very impressive. Uh, so so after your discussion with Gabby, uh, like when you got the inspiration, so before launching Breeder DAO, were there any kind of iterations that you did, like any experimentation that you did and you thought that, okay, this is definitely a gap and we can monetize it. Uh, so before launching Birida, was there opportunity there to kind of uh, experiment with? Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, we didn't really start off as like Breeder DAO. Um, back in Q2 of 2021, we were just simply some young individuals who just wanted to earn some money from this entire space. And so we did an experiment. Um, we saw that the market, uh, at least Axie Infinity Marketplace, um, was quite lucrative. There's a lot of volume um, and the prices of assets went from $200 to $800 in a week. And so we thought that, you know, maybe there's an opportunity here. And so we ran an initial experiment. We pitched it to an investor who seeded us like 180K. And then in less than three months, we were able to multiply that capital uh, by 800%. So um, we thought, again, that it was something that um, was unsustainable, but then 
again, when we talk to like Gabby, Guilds, Games, everyone will share the same sentiment in that there's a lack of quality asset. And if you guys can actually provide that for the market, then it restores like the balance between the demand and supply. And there really is an opportunity that you can play here. Yeah, that's that's really good. So even before launching the project, there was some kind of execution. There was some kind of skin yep. in the game and, and, and actually uh, seeing whether whether product will have a good fit with the market. I think now it's a good way to kind of segue, in, segue into what uh, Breeder DAO is, what your long-term vision for it is, and um, and actually what are you trying to solve in general? So I think the simplest term um, or the simplest like metaphor for Breeder DAO would be a factory. Um, I know that a lot of us here are very familiar with you know FMCGs like Nestle, Procter & Gamble, Unilever, and it basically is the same thing, right? But instead of like pushing out like consumer goods, what we actually bring here uh, would be digital assets. And it can go anywhere from, you know, uh, in-game assets such as Axis, Krabada, uh, Pegasi, to eventually, and if the metaverse matures, right, to you, your wearables for your avatars to furnitures for your digital homes. And these are the things that we're looking at, uh, at least building over the long term. So... Our goal uh, and our vision for Breeder DAO is to really onboard the next billion users of the metaverse. And right now, the demand is gaming, so we're actually in gaming. But in the future, if the demand goes towards a general metaverse where people would just want to explore the world that we've built uh, within like this universe, then we would go towards that. But yeah, the general goal is uh, or remains to be the same. Uh, to, to be able to become like a pillar, uh, within the metaverse ecosystem that helps people, uh, uh, and, and provides that seamless and frictionless experience for the, the growth of these individuals. Um, precisely why, um, if you've been following us, we have like play core, um, because that's a gap that we saw that, uh, is needed by a lot of individuals. Playcore is a content aggregator and at the same time, an analytics dashboard that aims to provide or educate users. Um, before entering the market or generally for anyone who would just want to look into um, anything or study about blockchain gaming, there's a resource that they can look at, an aggregator that they can depend on. And yeah, I mean, over the course of our journey here, we've been seeing a lot of gaps and we plan to tackle like some of these, right? Uh, especially if the market or if some of the other projects or builders in the space do not tackle on these problems. But again, essentially, it's like a seamless and frictionless experience for uh, the, the the players or the users uh, within the ecosystem. Yeah, th- that is actually very interesting. So, so but when I started studying blockchain gaming, uh, it is very complex. It's it's literally like an economy, and you have to think like a macroeconomist. So that brings me to this question: like, how do you optimize breeding? How do you optimize manufacturing of different NFTs and different game assets? How do you think about it? What are some of the tools you use? You did mention Playcore. Is Playcore one of the tools that uh, basically is Breeder DAO team is using to manufacture assets to kind of look into the trends? Or is it more like an aggregator for general audience to see where the market is going? So we'd love to explore that with you. Uh, if you want to share your screen and even walk us through Playcore, perhaps feel free to do that as well. Right. Okay. So uh, maybe to give you an idea, breeding is not as simple as people may think. Uh, not all assets are created equal and you can't just randomly choose like assets and then breed them and then hope that the outcome will be you know, what you expected it to be. So there's actually algorithms involved and probabilities involved that will allow you to maximize, you know, the occurrence of a specific trait. And over time, you know, we expect uh, a lot of these to change and to improve that uh, it's not just going to be as straightforward as just combining things and then hoping for an outcome. Uh, it There's going to be like risk factors involved, um, chances of you to break the asset, to break the item, uh, and, you know, if you're not careful, then it's going to be more costly to actually build something than, you know, just buying it from the marketplace, especially if you're not optimizing for anything. And the way we actually do it is not just, uh, you know, again, blindly breeding. We dive deep into the game, understand like the situation there, understand like uh, the mechanics uh, involved in the game design itself to see what sort of things we should produce and what sort of things do people want to buy, right? And then, you know, compare that against like quantitative data of like looking at the marketplace itself. What are people actually buying? What are people actually producing? Where is the liquidity heading towards, right? And Playcore comes into play here because um, 
play core economics, uh, I mean, token economics is something that's very crucial um, to the, to this entire like GameFi ecosystem. Um, the the main difference between a traditional game and you know any blockchain gaming would be the tokenomics. Uh, and for you to be able to come up with a successful blockchain game, you would not only need to um, make like the gameplay sound, but you would also need to make like the tokenomics sound, because income is a strong motivator for anyone. And you not only target people who just genuinely want to play here, but also people who would want to try and take a stab in terms of being able to earn income from from um, from these games. Again, not to say that, you know, we should go down the route where um, gaming would be reduced towards an income stream because at the core of gaming is really to provide like entertainment with income as a bonus or income as an added element. But again, it's hard to uh, argue that people or the only ones that are going to be incentivized to play the games are really just the gamers because the fact that you're able to allow people to kind of create value means that there will be people who would um, have that primary uh, motivator as income, right? So um yeah, I mean, um, we have like a lot more tools and technology that we're building in-house apart from Playcore. And Playcore really acted as like, again, as a need uh, in the space that we've realized and that we wanted to share to the community. Because one of the reasons why we entered in the space uh, is uh, to be able to help like a lot more people. And we don't want people to get discouraged from the space because of lack of uh, the lack of information and making like uneducated guesses and like, you know, FOMOing into everything because the last thing we want is that people getting discouraged um, because they bought in high. And then uh, after like a few months or a few weeks or even a few days, the value of the asset that they bought for a thousand bucks is now just like $2. So um, we want to provide them the necessary tools that would allow them to also um, create like educated guests uh, or, or, or like informed decisions backed by data and backed by the resources that's available. Yeah, love it. Uh, so, so one thing I want to explore with you, I feel like you guys have a first mover advantage and given the complexity of this game, you guys have already acquired experience. So one analogy would be just comparing you to PNG that you guys might be able to establish a moat because of your experience, because of your first mover advantage and, and because of your support. So how do you kind of see that moat evolving and how do you kind of strengthen that competitive advantage uh, over the period of time? Right. Um, I think first mover advantage is definitely a huge advantage, especially given the market conditions that you have right now. Um, capital moat, for example, is not easy to go by uh, during this market. VCs are a bit more apprehensive in terms of you know providing capital to um, projects and they're, they tend to get a bit picky, right? But you know, I mean, does it mean that because you're a first mover and you have that capital mode that you stop building? Uh, innovation and continuous development will always be a key to success. Uh, the space is quite early and play to earn itself is very young uh, and nobody really knows where this is going to head. And one of the things that we believe will change is that, you know, the play to earn is definitely going to transform to maybe a play and earn or like, you know, playing with income as a bonus or whatever it is that people want to call it, right? But it definitely is not the end stage. And as we continue to develop, then all of the models, especially the infras that are being built around the current model, has to change uh, simultaneously and has to be developed also uh, if we want to retain our advantage in this space. And for our team, that's basically being on the watch on what the next... uh uh, iterations of the play to earn space is going to be and then being able to pivot our model to cater to these like other games or newer form of games right uh, not to say as well that you know all of these current games are going to die but you know if it so happened that there's a new formula or, or there's a new thing that people are now following um, um, then we would need to be uh, adaptable and we would need to be able to uh, we need to be agile in terms of like adapting to these changes yeah, so, so this brings me to the second question, since the space is evolving. Uh, so, so it's a two-part question. So first part question is, what are some of the different guilds and games that you have partnered with? And the second part of that question is, what variables at the moment uh, you kind of look into when deciding to, let's say, partner up with a particular guild or a game? 
Okay, so maybe I'll touch on like the game part first, uh, and then maybe proceed with the guild afterwards. So, in the game part, I mean, we've released like tons of announcements, having twenty plus games, you know, that comprise of Crypto Unicorns, Angelic, Metalcore, you name it, right? Um, but we've also had like partner games, which we're currently operating our farms on, uh, and we currently are providing like assets for five different games, and. These are AFC, Krabada, uh, Pegasi, uh, Cybol, as well as Fancy Birds. And in the future, you know, the goal is to be able to produce like assets for any particular game that the guilds demand us off. Because we're game agnostic and wherever the demand is, we go. And um, if we want to be decentralized or the go-to marketplace, um, then we want to be able to provide like whatever it is that our customer wants. So that customers would be the guilds, would be individual players. And yeah, I mean, in terms of like the games that we partner with, uh, the first and foremost, like, and the most obvious one would be if there's like a breeding or crafting mechanism, right? Um, because then uh, if, if there's no like any way or any means to produce like assets, then we won't really be able to add that much value because the primary point of us being here is to inject like supply into the marketplace to allow for more growth and more people to be onboarded into that particular game. Now, the second would be like the tokenomics or the mint and burn like um, mechanics within the game. Um, we believe that a lot uh, because of this, the, the the amount of like, uh, I guess, awareness that the space have, um, there's also a lot of bad actors who want to enter the space. And, you know, you have all of these Ponzi's, you have all of these um, yes, players who are just looking to extract value from it. And you want to differentiate that from the rest, right? Uh, are these people like really creating something new, something valuable, or are they just looking to copy whatever already exists in the hopes of tricking some people into entering? So these are the things that we also look at. Um, economic sustainability, uh, in terms of driving more utility for the token is another thing that we're looking at um, because ultimately that determines whether or not a game will survive over the yeah, yeah I want to double click on that so so how does the how does due diligence work because I feel uh, there, there's just a lot here right like you guys are producing the asset optimizing for that but then there is a lot of due diligence so this could be also one area of competitive advantage where you guys have to act as a fundamental analyst yep. or maybe perhaps as a, VC, as a VC get on different calls and just get into the depth of the tokenomics and sustainability. So can you just like walk us, like how, how does that work? How do you guys optimize that due diligence process? Yeah, of course. I mean, you know, the first thing that any good analyst or any good project within the space uh, do is to be able to separate the bad ones uh, and to associate with themselves uh, themselves with the good ones, right? Because being like an icon or being like a leader in the space also comes with the responsibility for you to uh, help people uh, in terms of filtering out or weeding out these bad uh, actors or like um, bad projects, right? So... The first thing that we usually do is to request for you know the tangible stuff like a white paper um, the deck if they have that whatever demo videos that they have because a lot of games actually are driven by narrative they don't even have like a working product or a working model right so um on our end right uh can the team really execute? Um, what are the cohort of individuals uh, that are developing this project? So yeah, um, and you can immediately see that from the white paper. Now from, from there, right, if it actually passes like our criteria, then we request for a call with the team, see if they actually uh, have what it takes to, to, to build based on you know how they communicate, um, the kind of people that they're onboarding into their team and the kind of partners that they have as well. So, you know, uh, with one call, you can immediately see if a person uh, is actually trying to bullshit his way out of like something or not, right? Or if a person really understands what he's actually built uh, rather than, you know, just copying off like whatever model is able to trick some people into buying like whatever uh, it is that they're trying to sell. And then... I guess lastly, uh, as a final step, would be to check like who are the backers uh, and and uh, who are these guys that are actually building. Um, this will be the final due diligence. Does a company really exist or is it just a scam? Uh, and then you know typical due diligence questions uh, and then KYC.
uh, just to be able to know like who are building this and what kind of competence do they really have. Um, the last one would be uh, the gameplay itself. Um, we believe that eventually games are only going to be sustainable if they go back to the core of being fun, right? Of providing entertainment to a lot of these individuals. So yeah, gameplay plays a huge role in whether or not we want to kind of partner up with a game. Because, I mean, of course, it's not to say like everything has to be triple A, right? Because uh, entertainment can also come from, you know, these like uh, games like these card games, for example, or turn-based RPG tactics games, right? So um, it really depends on what we believe um, would actually um, hit or like be a hit in the market and, you know, fun games, right? Um, so yeah, um, that's the final criteria. And then going back to, you know, guilds. Guilds are actually our clients. Um, we exist or we've existed because um, we want to provide support to all of these guilds um, that are eventually um, helping out all of these players or onboarding these players. Um, the onset of like all of these um, pay to earn, uh, play to earn games and then having to purchase the resources early on to be able to um, play the game also created that um, guild system um, because not a lot of people can afford to purchase these assets. So right now, the direct connection to all of these uh, players would be via the guilds. And you know, we're generally not picky with the guilds that we partner with. It doesn't mean that if they're not part of like the top 25 guilds, then we don't like partner with them. In fact, it's the opposite. We want to onboard as much guilds as possible because interesting fact, um, the number of scholars that the top five guilds have combined it is really just 5% of Axie Infinity's daily average users. And so, you know, if you want to be like the go-to asset manufacturer who's providing like these assets to the general population, then you'd want to tap to these other guilds, uh, the smaller ones, because they actually comprise like 95%. And so, yeah, I mean, we're currently just expanding our reach um, to be able to partner up to these guilds. It doesn't matter whether, you know, you're, you're, you're huge, you're small. We just want you to be part of our network because the thing that we offer the guilds are not just simply straight up, like offering them um, or, or providing their asset requirements. We also help them in terms of like deal flows. We also help them uh, in terms of like identifying what games or what assets to produce, um, especially in line with whatever um kind of players that they have yeah one, one takeaway uh, from this this question was that you're agnostic guild agnostic so so yes. i have two questions so so that that kind of highlights to me that kind of signals to me that there isn't any issue with the supply crunch let's say if if guilds demand certain particular asset you guys will be able to produce it so for me as an investor or, or perhaps an analyst that's a that's a good thing and and second thing just want to double click on this uh, could read it out actually, like in terms of building up investment thesis, uh, can we argue this is like a, like, let's say if you want to have a index exposure of different guilds, as well as index exposure of different games, like that's the thesis for the token and that's the thesis for the read it out. So I want to... Uh, um, like double click on those two parts of the question now. Right. You know, one of the things that we've also discussed like internally is that maybe we can be the proxy for all of these games and guilds, right? Because we're actually connected to them, we're exposed to them, and we know like what kind of exposure we want for each of these, right? And then maybe, you know, people who are unsure or unfamiliar with this entire game by ecosystem but wants exposure can actually, you know, use Breeder DAO as a proxy to that and you know, from there, like you can build like tons of other, I don't know, like utility or projects, right? But uh, I, I feel like that's a possibility, but that's like not uh, part of our focus at the moment. But again, like if in the future, you know, we realize that there is a need for that because a lot of people do not really know like what's happening, but once exposure, then by all means, right, we'll do it. Um, but again, like um, something that we're exploring, but we're not really um, putting all our resources into. Uh, in general, we have like tons of these, uh, a lot of these things that we're looking at, but we're not really like, you know, dead set on like building because uh, it tends to eat away our focus from the actual thing that we're supposed to be providing, which is manufacturing and creation of these digital assets. All right. Uh, that makes sense. Now, I, now I think like from my perspective, one of the uh, like biggest curiosity I had was regarding the token utility of breed. 
Um, so I wanted to discuss that. Like it kind of initially with the white paper kind of felt felt like it's a bit like Tok Mac for gaming. Um, yep. Is it okay? <laughs> and I also wanted to do, yeah. kind of explore who do you reckon will be the end users of the token? Like what benefits, let's say, business to business guilds get of holding the token versus retail? And how will the DAO perhaps uh, acquire revenue and all of these different mechanics? So I just wanted to uh, explore that with you in, in detail. Right. So you're right about the token back part, um, but that's only one of the utilities. And, you know, we actually structured this entire like token utility around who we expect are going to be the end users uh, for our token. And we've ironed out or we've, we've actually um, reduced it to three. Uh, these are the games, the guilds, and the gaming enthusiast. Now, on the game part, it's, as you said, right, a tokemak style where people can actually decide on which games we should provide liquidity to. Because even though we say that we're, you know, the largest or the factory of the metaverse, right, our resources are limited as well. With a number of games that exist out there, we're only like a fraction of it, right? So it's impossible for us to be able to provide assets to all of these games. And it's quite hard for us to be able to track all of these games as well. So, yeah, I mean, we would need the help of the people, the community uh, and the DAO to vote on like which games we should provide like asset liquidity to and inject like supply back into the marketplace. So that's the first utility catered towards games. The second would be on the guild side. Um, for any game, you know, um, I think this is quite common knowledge that demand will always be greater than the supply. And so if guilds would want to get that initial supply, um, they would need to stake our tokens and then um, the the number of um, the proportion of the allocation that you can get will be dependent on the number of stake breed that you have. So it kind of is similar to how launch pads typically work, which is why we call this initiative like initial breed offering because the initial supply will be geared towards people who would actually stake our tokens versus those who doesn't uh, or, or those who don't. Right. So. And lastly would be the gaming enthusiast. Now, we're building a lot of tools here, uh, analytics, dashboards, um, even, you know, uh, mass production tools that we hope to share with everyone. And the way that you'll be able to access this is via staking our token. Um, the more you stake, of course, the more um, that you can, the, the more you can use these um, tools that we have to produce more assets. So it, it is kind of related, to, uh, correlated to that, right? So if you want to produce like a hundred assets, you would need to stake like a hundred. If you need to produce like a thousand, then you stake a thousand, right? So so it, th there's that, uh, I guess, like functionality. Um, and then apart from that, uh, because we are actually a manufacturing and selling like business or project, right? Uh, we also earn like profits from the assets that we produce. And then eventually the DAO will decide on how um, you want to, or, or they want that to be distributed. Um, we, we talked about like breeder DAO spoils uh, within our white paper, and that essentially follows a buyback and distribute model similar to how Sushi works. And the DAO will decide like how much of the profits made during the year, right, should be distributed back to people or how much of the um, fees that um, breeder DAO was able to generate um, be um I guess, like be returned back to the community in the form of like staking, of course. Yeah, so I, I wanted to just like explore the retail part, like just 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 pick your brains on this. Uh, so recently have been looking into different investment DAO. So, so the way some of the investment DAO work is, let's say you have different tire system. Let's say you have tire one, you stake this much token or have this much in your wallet. Uh, you have access to tire one, then tire two, tire three. Could we perhaps in the future, I know it's a bit of a long shot, can retail perhaps, let's say, stake a lot of tokens and even have access to, let's say, certain channels within Discord where deal flows are shared or something along those lines? Is that something uh, which you guys are perhaps exploring but not finalized? Again, not financial advice, but but is that something that, that's in your mind, like in terms of your future roadmap? Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, we've already started. So if you're part of the guild partners uh, on our Discord, then there's actually an exclusive channel for you guys where we share like some deal flows. Um, one that we did just recently would be Big Time, um, where they gave us exclusive deals for their lands and we share that uh, with our guild partners and so you know a lot of these things are going to come there uh, are going to come there and um, right now it's currently experimental because we don't know like how exactly we want to work it out but we're definitely doing all sorts of things to try and experiment and see how the people or the community would react 
and then eventually, you know, maybe turn it into a product or something. But yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a very interesting thought and one that we're currently working on right now. Yeah, that, that's good. That, that's exciting. Um, now, I think I just want to, like, we, we kind of discussed this already. Now, I just want to segue into some of the general uh, industry questions. So uh, the, this this sure. this came up again and again, uh, the play to earn game ev- evolution. So how do you kind of see it? Like, do you see where we'll be moving towards this type of economy where it will be play play and earn or where where there will be some crypto native element, but the focus of the game will be just play to joy and not earn that much or some iteration of current play to earn uh, with, 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 let's say, maybe three tokens, four tokens to make the uh, game game sustainable or maybe perhaps the DAO acts like the Fed, Federal Reserve where they're pulling out different monetary policy and fiscal policy to sustain the game. Uh, I'm very excited about the space. Also want to see how you kind of see it evolving over the period of time. No, I, I believe that, you know, eventually uh, it's going to go back to its roots of like just really providing entertainment. But that's not to say that, you know, play to earn is going to die or like play and earn will be the only thing that people are going to use blockchain for, right? Because the onset of like free to play didn't necessarily kill like pay to play, right? And people... Uh, or, or like it still targets like a specific demographic. And if it works for some people, then who are you or who are we to actually say that, you know, it's not going to be sustainable, right? So I feel like the general market for sure will go back or, or will go towards like a play and earn because we've seen what happened with play to earn that at one point it really uh, reaches that inflection point where the number of users that are being onboarded is uh i guess relatively small compared to the number of people that are burning or are minting the token which is why you know the the token is in constant decline but again like that's also just uh you also just need to introduce like a lot more burning functionalities um in order to make that sustainable right so i i am not dead set on like saying that pay to uh play to earn is definitely going to die and that play and earn is the new thing that people would um, rush towards. And that's the only economics uh, or that that's the only like um, way to achieve sustainability using uh, blockchain within gaming, right? Uh, for me, what's clear is that uh, uh, blockchain value uh, to gaming uh, is like really clear. Because prior to this one, um, people have already been trading. You have games like EVE Online, right? Um, where economics is the entire game. And people uh, orchestrate or organize like block, black markets to be able to buy and sell their assets. So this is something that's definitely not new, um, but um, was allowed for by blockchain. Now you get to sell like all of these assets and... Yeah, I feel like, you know, the, 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 the core proposition and the value of blockchain is clear. And it's really up to the developers and up to us to really see how we can use this in the best way possible that will encourage more audience and more users to uh, enter the space. Yeah, yeah, I share, I echo this similar sentiment. Yeah, there are a lot of experiments happening. Recently, saw so Step In basically copy XE Infinity, but having more demand things. Uh, Krabada, for example, having yep. three tokens. A lot of things happening. Let's see. <laughs> Let's see how this yep. evolves. Well, yep. I mean, because it's very early, right? And uh, we're not just talking about game- gameplay, but there's an added element of like economics. People are trying to change uh, the variables and seeing really what would work. And uh, essentially, you know, we would be able to arrive, I think, and I hope, at a formula that would work that people can more or less copy and then that's going to be like an economic sustainable that's going to be sustainable but again uh one thing for sure is that um even though you've arrived at formula constant development and innovation is still crucial because even though you've arrived at that singular point um people are still going to game try and game it and you know uh it's only going to be a matter of time because before that kind of model becomes obsolete as well um, and if we try and settle, then we lose the entire value to the game or, or that blockchain provides the gaming. Yeah. Yeah. I think there is a trade off. Like, one beautiful thing about having the economics and the economy is that then these uh, experiments shouldn't be valued like a company, it should be valued like economy. And economies sometimes can be in billions and trillions. But then the other element, yes. the other trade off is 
that in order to manage that economy, that there is this trade-off of these like centralization because you do need the DAO presence or need a central entity to constantly pull different levers, like, like increase the burn, decrease the burn. So similar to central bank and central yep. bank and the uh, fiscal gov- yep. like fiscal part of the government where they change the tax rate. So so yeah, it's 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 very yep. uh, very very interesting. Although that's also the beauty of DAOs, right? I mean, having a hive mind versus like, you know, centralized corporations or agencies where it's really up to the developers to determine like what sorts of functionalities or what sorts of developments would work. If you have the community who are your users, by the way, um, telling you what they want and then how we can improve the game, then you can more or less guarantee that if it's something that they want, that it could be for the benefit of a lot more individuals and you know, sharing or having their inputs more than just limiting it to a few people uh, who are part of the core team um, creates a ton of value and not just for them, but for everyone else. Right? I agree. Um, and it also kind of makes me com- like give me comfort that let's say, let's say when we talk about Federal Reserve, uh, let's say now the inflation is going high, people blame the Federal Reserve. But since they already vote on a particular yep. proposal, they have nobody to blame it on, but rather than internalize yep. the yep. internalize what's happening. Um, so, 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 so within yep. the whole ecosystem, we are also seeing gaming guilds evolve. Like, how do you kind of see that trend? Like, how do you kind of see gaming guilds evolve? One sub trend within 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 the gaming guild has been the games have started to implement the rental feature. So, for example, in Step In and Rumble Kong and some of the other games that are coming up, they'll have a yep. rental feature. So, it kind of makes me question. Like, if, if 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 that goes through, if people can rent out the NFTs, then do we actually need a guild? Like, how do you kind of think about about the space and, and some of the trends you're seeing? So I feel like the core proposition of gaming guilds isn't really like the ability to own the asset, but more of like having a community that can back you and support you, right? Help you learn the ropes of a particular game. Um have that other person or have a community that has that shares the same interests as you and you know you you already have like these esports organizations right at the moment and they call themselves the original guilds because you know at the core of it is just really like a community right and you know um we have people um right now who's uh addressing like whatever it is that the guilds need um you mentioned like or, or like what some of the guilds may seem to provide, but not necessarily at the core of it, like, you know, providing rental marketplace or uh, uh, the ability to rent straight from the marketplace. Because these guilds aren't supposed to be financial institutions whose sole task is loaning out assets uh, with a promise of the returns, right? They're supposed to be a community um, that allows people to enhance their experience within these games. And you know, I believe that the space matures and as more and more games are developed, then you also have like a cohort of guilds that are going to specialize on specific things. Say, you know, this guild is actually specialized or specializes in FPS. This kind of guild specializes in MMORPG, right? Uh, and we'll see like different cohorts of guilds who are playing like different kinds of games. And providing like different communities or opportunities for different players to have like broader set of communities. Yeah, so so YGG is doing one cool thing where they have different sub DAOs depending on regions and games. Yep. So so so, yep. so, so that kind of makes me think of them as like index play on on the gaming guilds itself. Right. Uh, right. But, but then there are some different gaming guilds. Like I think Merit Circle is going that route where they're, they're thinking of themselves as as gaming studios. So, so, so as the space evolves, do you think these gaming guilds will actually also sort of function as gaming DCs, and maybe perhaps in the future studios, and then we perhaps might not have the need for let's say other other types of DCs? Like, do you think in an extreme uh, case scenario those possibilities might be true, like especially in the gaming blockchain uh, vertical? Could be. I mean, if you look at the VCs right now, right, um, the support that they offer would be more on the tokenomic side would be more on like whatever game or, 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 or knowledge that they have with prior, previous games. But with guilds, for example, um, you have the players themselves acting as like uh, researchers in terms or analysts, right? In terms of analyzing what sort of game designs or mechanisms would work. So, I mean, I'm not 
so I'm not discrediting like the entire idea, right? But because you have like specific VCs uh, who can help you with specific things like recruitment, um, you know, like you know, economics, network partnerships, right? And these are things that gaming guilds might have as well, but not everyone will. So I don't necessarily think that gaming guilds will change or completely eradicate. I feel like there could be a, a, a healthy balance between the two, right? Gaming guilds also acting as VCs, but VCs still being VCs, right? Uh, and it ultimately just depends on what kind of um, investments or what kind of partners you're looking at. But at least like it gives an option for a lot of people. If it's just game design that you're after and uh, a specific VC can provide you with the necessary, I guess, tools or like technology to allow you to enhance that, then you'd still go for like that VC over a gaming guild, um, especially if they don't or they can't provide like the specific uh, cohort or the specific skill set that you would need. So uh, at the end of the day, it really depends on the competency of the team and the kind of uh, support that they need. Could be, you know, players, then if it's players, then go for like a gaming guild. If it's like, I don't know, partnerships, then maybe VCs would have more. But yeah, I mean, it really depends. Yeah, I mean, uh, you are the expert here since you're seeing, like you've gone through the both, right? Like you have interacted with guilds as well as VCs. So I, I, I kind of trust your judgment more on, on, on forecast, like foreseeing that trend. Um, since you're deep in the weeds of, of crypto gaming now, what are some of the upcoming games and projects that excites you? Like you think uh, could be game changing or, or or just just really exciting in terms of innovation? Yeah, so I mean... Right now, we're exploring or we're greatly exploring the crypto unicorns. I feel like uh, not a lot of people were able to enjoy it because of the entire like uh, or because of the macro conditions at the moment. But for sure, like once they recover, they would slowly seep into it and look into it. Uh, I think crypto unicorns bring something unique because they are combining like all of these uh, breeding, crafting, land play all in one go. Um, which is something that we haven't seen. Um, previous iterations, even with Axie Infinity, they were releasing it slowly one by one. So it would inst- be interesting to see like how everything would play, especially if you release them simultaneously. You also have the likes of Guild of Guardians. Uh, you also have you know um, Neon Heroes, for example. Um, and these are the games that I would feel like um, deviates from what we've already seen uh, currently. And it would be exciting to see I mean, we've seen like similar gameplays, at least the non-block uh, with the non-blockchain games, right? But uh, these ones uh, bring something new, um, especially within the realm of like blockchain gaming. It would be interesting how they thought through like the tokenomics and how, you know, adding that layer makes it all the more complicated. And you know, uh, if that kind or if whatever it is that they have planned would be more sustainable than whatever it is that is currently produced or we currently have. Um. Rens, uh, when you were saying, I was noting down the names and I'll, I'll post the links, link below for, for our audience. Uh, Crypto <laughs> Unicorn is one I have heard of, but haven't done a deep dive on. So that could be interesting. Uh, so Rens, uh, coming to the yep. last leg of the podcast, I'm, I'm going to ask you some, I would say some difficult questions and it would be kind of like a, a rapid fire. So what do you think uh, are the top three risks that Breeder DAO faces, or maybe some of the risks that perhaps uh, keeps you up at night? Like, I think it's towards the general trend of like blockchain gaming in general, um, not specific to uh, you know Breeder DAO, but towards the entire system. Um, if people suddenly decide that you know blockchain doesn't add any value to crypto gaming, then uh, I think like the whole space would crumble. Um, our proposition here. Uh, will serve no one, right? So um, that's one of the things that keeps me up at night, really. Although I'm consoled by the fact that uh, I believe that the value is very clear and clear as day, right? So um, kind of is something that may happen, but would most likely not happen. But again, uh, maybe I'm just a maxi, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, hypothetically, if, if, if everything, like my perception is everything will be fine, the, the trend is very strong. You see gaming guilds actually competing against you as one of the risks, like them being your core customer. I know you guys are diversifying away towards other other use cases. Yep. Is, is that one use case, uh, is that one risk factor that can emerge, let's say, five years time, four years time? Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, you know, competition 
uh, is always a huge uh, risk, right, to any business. Although I'd like to think that at this point, like competition is healthy because if you actually have people um, following your footsteps and doing the same model, it means that the model has like a demand and the core proposition that you're offering really has value to a lot of individuals, precisely why more and more people are kind of copying, right? So, I mean, at this stage, uh, I really would enjoy that sort of competition just as an added testament that what it is that we're doing here is really something that provides value to the space and not just something that we believe uh, adds value to our goals, right? That, that makes sense. So I was reading this report. I think Global Coin Research posted this report. And then I looked at the market cap. So at the moment, the market cap, I don't know, it's below 10 million. You guys have raised, I don't know, 10 million and then also did the IDO and also earning revenue. Again, not financial advice. Do you yep. think there is a dislocation arbitrage play here for for B token? I kind of feel, feel feel like that, or do you think is or is is there something I'm missing? I mean, uh, I wouldn't say anything concrete, uh, or I wouldn't give like any recommendations. But I can tell you this, uh, and I think it's something that's on the research as well. Our cash position is three times the current market cap, so. I mean, I don't know what you want to do with that information, but I'm just telling you. No, financial yes, yes. yes. Got it, got it, got it. Um, uh, so, 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 w- what is ahead of Breeder Dow? Like, what, what does the next two, three years in terms of roadmap looks like, and and what are some of the exciting things that at the moment market is just not even looking at? People don't even know about uh, with regards right. to Breeder Dow. So. I mean, the prior to this one, the most important milestone that we want to achieve would be uh, the token launch, right? Because that allows for the distribution of the token. Uh, and we've been transparent about this. Like right after we do our token launch, we're immediately going to launch governance because we believe that, you know, accessing or tapping the community to help you with the governance is really going to be a huge help in terms of directing where we want to go and then how we do we proceed from here. Uh, just take a look at the games that are launching left and right, right? It's hard for us to be able to track them. But if the community is on our side in terms of like helping us uh, filter and, and, and funnel them into our channels, then we would be, uh, or it would make the process much more efficient, right? So governance is one thing that we're really pushing out. Uh, we hope to have this by next week, next uh, by, by, by next month, sorry. Uh, and then the next few things that we're building that we've also promised would be the tools that we have in-house, we're slowly going to make them available for people to use and to enjoy. Um, eventually, you know, you wouldn't have to interact directly with these marketplaces um, to be able to produce like assets at scale. Uh, and then if it's more of like identifying how do we produce these assets, then we would be helping you guys because we're going to um, make it easy for you to identify what sorts of assets you should combine to be able to come up with these tools. Uh, mass production is also going to be easy because uh, our tools allows you to not waste your time on like simultaneously clicking like all of these buttons just to produce like more assets, but you know, you can do it simultaneously. Uh, and then some things that we uh, are looking at as well would be a multi-chain cross-chain marketplace that allows you to just buy from um, uh, just buy from a singular place uh, whatever game asset you would need uh, and you would immediately be able to interact with it. Uh, again, like our mission is to provide that seamless and frictionless experience for a lot of individuals here in the space. And right now, you know, um, we feel like moving from one wallet to another, having to bridge your funds from one wallet to another, just in order to participate in another economy from another chain is taxing for a lot of individuals and something that may not be as familiar for a lot of individuals. So that's that's definitely something that we're looking at. Um, also, one of the things uh, that Breeder Dow, or at least the ecosystem, is trying to build would be more information, like Playcore. Continuous development of like the features within Playcore uh, is something that we also plan to push out. Uh, more information, more partnerships, uh, and just improving like whatever network that we currently have right at the moment to be able to touch on like more, or to be able to have more impact uh, in the space in general. Vance, it was a pleasure having you. I'm, I'm, I learned, I learned a lot. Uh, it, it was very interesting. So before we depart, has there anything that we, ha- is, is there anything we have missed, or anything, or any closing thought you might have? I think we've covered like most. Uh, uh, the one thing I would like to, you know, maybe remind people is that if you like what we're doing and if you share our vision. 
uh, our token is actually available on Uniswap, Hobi, and Mexi. And, you know, uh, we want uh, more and more people who share that vision uh, and we welcome you into our community. So if you want to contribute, if you want to be part of the DAO that we're building, and if you want to help like onboard the next billion players into the metaverse and share that vision of helping the entire ecosystem uh, all together, then we would be more than happy to have you with us. Friends, thank you so much for coming to the 100X. It was a pleasure having you. And I'm going to share, uh, I'm going to also share the research report we did on, on Reader DAO uh, when, when the podcast is up. So again, thank you. Thank you for coming. Gotcha. Thank you so much, Mehdi. It's been a pleasure.